are these people? Independent Media Alliance. Anybody know what this is? Anybody hear this? Had, did you hear about this, Reef? No. No. Uh, kind of. Derek Bros and... Whitney Webb. That's um, correct. Whitney Webb. Webb. Exactly. So, yeah. kind of interesting. And I, I didn't actually bring up the parallel, but this sounds similar to the concept and idea behind the network that you're watching this on right now. But this is awesome to hear and see and encouraging that a, we were in the right direction and that people are seeing what we're seeing and thinking they need to do the same. This week, through now this was published at offguardian.com, which is uh, also an indie media award honoree. There's a bunch of them, and I'm going to show you who all of them are that are part of this alliance. Uh, that did not, I didn't hear that if you played it, but. Um, yeah, I'm working on all that. Okay, well, I got this one. Um, uh, for immediate release, announcing the Independent Media Alliance, written by Derek Bros And T-Lev, uh, Ryan Christian also wrote something. I like what Derek wrote. Today we're thrilled to announce the creation of the Independent Media Alliance, or IMA, a collaborative effort focused on promoting objective, fact-based media from a diverse team of journalists, podcasters, and writers. Our emphasis will be focused on, will be on countering narratives currently being seated within the alternative media space, including but not limited to the false two-party paradigm, opium in politicians, support for imperial wars, fifth-generation warfare, and technocratic solutions to legitimate problems like digital IDs pitched as the only solution for immigration and voting mm -hmm. fraud prevention, etc. right? We've seen all this kind of vernacular, this kind of language, right? The creation of IMA was initiated by Whitney Webb of Unlimited Hangout, Ryan Christian of The Amer Last American Vagabond, both are Indie Media Award honorees, and Derek Bros of the Conscious Resistance Network. Webb, Christian, and Bros have invited more than a dozen journalists, podcasters, and media outlets to join their alliance. The current roster includes several other Indie Media Award honorees and others who I'm sure you're well aware of, um, Hakeem Anwar, who well, I'm not familiar with. Catherine Austin Fitz, we certainly know her from the Solari Report. Jason Bassler from the Free Thought Project, I remember him. I know him pretty well. Uh, he's on Substack. Jason Burmis, we know Jer Burmis pretty well. Both Cat Black and Kit Knightley from Off Guardian, which is one of the honorees. James Corbett from the Corbett Report. Ian Davis, Richard Grove from Grand Theft World. Rovi Morek from Geopolitics and Empire. Right, we've got Steve Poikinen from Slow News Day and AM Wake Up, Charlie Robinson from Macro Aggressions, and also Union of the Unwanted, and Carrie Welder, who I'm not as familiar with. So, those are the first, the dirty dozen, the first, the first dozen, more than a dozen. The IMA will take several actions in pursuit of this goal, including regular panels and debates featuring alliance members and guests, collaborative and joint investigations, and launching a new decentralized media network to host relevant content from Alliance members. The IMA will also be partnering with decentralized platform Odyssey to ensure that the content cannot be easily censored. Um, so, yes, I'm highly encouraged by some of the best of the best. Um, Nick, I would... Trying to be like INN? Hell. Uh, if it's anywhere close to INN, uh, you, know, you know, look, if INN can achieve anywhere close to whatever these guys do, uh, I can sh assure you with the size of the audiences that they all are bringing and the the cachet and the backgrounds that they all have, Richard Grove is damn good. Um, so is Solari Report. Agreed, Dr. Nick. Uh, so these are the uh, Indie Media Award honorees that are part of the Indie Media Alliance, Independent Media Alliance. I don't want to keep mixing those two things. Um, he lab the, the last American vagabond, which actually has six members to it. Uh, Corbett report, Whitney Webb, unlimited hangout off guardian. And that's Kit Knightley down in the right corner. That's Charlie Robinson down next to Kit. So we've got all of those already. And that's just the current members and they're going to be, I'm sure expanding 
And we're going to have new honorees for 2024. So there may be more in there. The next thing I wanted to talk about, Atlanta. Barry uh, Bonds. No, not Barry, Barry Bonds, Bonds either. The Atlanta solidarity bail fund for the stop cop city organizers who have been persecuted mm. and considered domestic terrorists though so all they did was protest cop city being built in a protected forest we got like a a, a sliver of good news but of course it's got to be wrapped in crap sorry guys yeah but the good news is, is that a spokesman for the Atlanta Solidarity Fund confirmed that the Georgia Attorney General's office will drop all money laundering charges against the three organizers. Yay! Three <laughs> organizers of the Atlanta Solidarity Fund were charged with one count each of money laundering and charity fraud in May of 2023, following a SWAT-style raid of their house by the GBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, and the APD, the Atlanta Police Department. Those organizers and 58 others were later charged with racketeering in August of 2023. Which is crazy. When you, when you think about how much civil forfeiture the Atlanta Police Department has taken part in, them accusing anyone of money laundering is pot calling kettle. Bonkers. For yes. Sure. So ridiculous. Um, now, Hearings in the racketeering case against the Solidarity Fund organizers and two other people were scheduled to begin Tuesday with prosecutors and defense attorneys preparing to make arguments on various motion fi motions filed since the case began. The racketeering and charity fraud charges are not expected to be dropped. And that's the wrapped in crap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. They <laughs> dropped the money. And, and that's the headline is they dropped the money laundering charges. Except they're still right. going to be charged with racketeering and charity fraud. But there were so many money laundering charges, it looks like, wow, 14 of the counts got dropped out of the 18, except the four that mattered. Deputy jo Georgia Attorney General John Fowler dropped counts 4 through 14 from the racketeering indictment during Tuesday's hearing. Those counts involve money transfers from the ASF organizers and claims that the three posted to an anti-cop website, which they didn't. Okay, and mm -hmm. it's actually four through 18. So it was actually, yeah, 14 counts that, that got dropped. But still, they're going to be charged with rac racketeering and charity fraud. Unbelievable. Next, yep. labor notes. Now... I was even hesitant to mention this, but it, it is noteworthy because Teamsters and Amazon drivers we've been talking about for a while. These are other Amazon drivers that work for the DSPs or the delivery service providers, the third parties. They're now yeah. going into their bosses and saying, we're unionizing. And they made an announcement. Now, this is, again, the Labor Notes is kind of linked with labor management more so and i don't really like where they are but the you know it, it, they're tied to big labor and union heads that are against corporate like the like the workers are but not in the quite in the same way so the you know, mm -hmm. these workers i stand in solidarity with that do want to unionize i still think that this was part of an overall teamsters effort that included undermining the independent effort of JFK 8 and Chris Smalls and right. then acting like they were coming in and doing him a favor and saving him and getting him a deal and making something happen and look good on the way out. Uh, this whole thing stinks to me. All right. Mm. But the story goes, of that, well, of, of Sean O'Brien, but Hundreds of Amazon mm -hmm. drivers at a delivery station in Queens, New York, marched on their bosses today to announce that they're joining the Teamsters. They're demanding the logistics giant recognize their union and negotiate a contract. I've, I've heard that record before. You know, and I just clipped a couple things from this, this, this article. This was one of the women that they spoke with, so it's only one person's opinion. She says they had no choice but to hear us. Workers followed the managers with their cell phone cameras recording and papers in hand, surrounding them from all sides. We were screaming and shouting out to let them know we're here and we want to be heard. And they, after a while, they finally calmed things down and 
they were talking over each other. They got so excited because they finally got enough orange vests in there to listen to them and listen to what they were saying. Right. Then they started to take turns and go around the room and they each one of them, it was almost like an intervention. Here's my story. Here's why I wanted to, and here's why we're unionizing. But most importantly mm -hmm. is that the drivers are part of Amazon's 4,400 delivery service partners program, meaning that they're nominally employed by contractors even while Amazon retains full control. They don't really work for Amazon. They work for a third party. These delivery drivers and queens right. are employed by three separate DSPs. Through DSPs, Amazon says it employs 390,000 drivers, but again, not, not really Amazon employees. And that's as big as the UPS fleet. All right? So the Teamsters see this, and they see that they can double their numbers. If they can figure out a way yeah. to organize and unionize the Amazon drivers under the Teamsters, they double their numbers. So they want to do this, and they've been looking at mm -hmm. doing this for years. Forget the Amazon warehouses. This is what I, this is what the Teamsters really want. I mean, they'd love to unionize the warehouses too. They want the drivers because that's where their bag is already is in unionizing drivers. All right, Amazon yeah. surpassed UPS in the parcel business in April. 695 delivery stations, 577 warehouses, including airport hubs. Crazy, crazy. All right. So that's that's Amazon and Teamsters. But there was another thing that happened with the Teamsters this week that I wanted to bring that I thought was also interesting that everybody seemed to get wrong. So right. frustrating. It's so frustrating. I was so mm. happy when I first saw this because they said, we're going for none of the above. And nobody's been more of an, uh -huh. an advocate for none of the above than me. Look, it's in my friggin' handle. All right. I love it. And I said initially, this is the way because I saw the press release. No endorsement for U.S. president. Woohoo! All right. Finally, a, la a labor union pushing back and saying neither of these candidates are good enough. Neither of them are going to give us a thing. That's kind of what they said. Except, mm. except once you look a little closer. All right. Now, yeah. Looks like we got ourselves a reader. Yeah, we, we somewhere around here. So, well, the union's extensive member polling showed no majority support for Vice President Harris and no universal support among the membership for President Trump. So wait a minute. Uh -huh. Just reading that sentence alone from the press release, that's a double fucking standard. Like, wow. So basically, universally, it would have to be Trump for the union to endorse that. But only if it was a majority would they have endorsed Harris, and they didn't get either, so they said neither. Wait, what? That's pretty right. weak while standing strong. What do I mean? Well, the Teamsters, in for whatever reason, weirdly enough, decided to be transparent about the whole thing. And they said, we've done the most extensive polling of our membership. Okay, and we got 21,000 results. They have 1.3 million members, and they conducted these polls for a fucking year. And they got 21,000, yep. and they're bragging and spiking the football like they just won the Super Bowl. Wait, what? Okay, so what you can't really see because it's, it's not zoomed in is that this says that between April, whatever, 19th and July 3rd, the Teamsters held town hall straw polls when Biden was still in the race and Biden was beating Trump. Okay. But any poll that they're showing that happened since they made the switcheroo and they anointed Harris instead of Biden shows Trump up by 25 right. to 27 points electronically and over the phone. Now, most of the presidential polls that you see from the media sample 1,000 to 1,500, maybe 2,000 people, not 21,000 mm. specific workers that belong to a specific union. This is a large enough sample set. The numbers don't lie, <laughs> and they spell disaster for you. Big Papa Pump, baby. All right? <laughs> don't, don't say that. You're not allowed to no. no that's, those words cannot be in the same. That's no. that's his that, that's his name. Don't wear it out, baby. Come on, <laughs> let's come on. This does you have another Scott Steiner sound effect. I know you've got in there. I got 
one and two thirds chance of winning. Yep, there we go. I knew one of them was there. All right. Woo! Yes. By the way, check out Pro Wrestling Talk with Angel Rivera and Miss Witchy Perfect Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on INN Eastern Time. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we're dropping the wrestling sound bits and we're we're talking about Shut pro up, wrestling bitch. here. We're talking about pro wrestling here. All right. The Teamsters, man, they find every way to fuck up. Even when they're doing well, they don't do well. Like, guys, you you had a layup here. First of all, your members are over almost 60% of your membership is saying they want Trump of the people that were surveyed and the people that responded. Uh a Scott, a Scotty Pippen layup at that. Like that, that's you know? that's a big number. Um, especially when it's a twenty-seven point spread, and you're deciding that it's duopoly, and you're not counting any other candidate. Which, oh yeah, by the way, more than five percent of the vote went to don't know or undecided on one of them or another candidate on the other. So that also, to me, had some significance. People that are talking about five percent, but that's that combines libertarian, um, D, D, PSA, a PSL, not a PSA, um, Greens, uh, Cornell West, Booby, BFL, Ken, Booby Kennedy, UAE. all of them. All right, no, not the UAE, they're not running WWE. a candidate, they're not running a candidate. <laughs> the UAE is not quite the WWF, no, Israel is the only foreign country running a candidate this year, <laughs> and they're running two of them. They're running a couple, yeah, exactly. All right, yeah. So um, that's our that's our Teamsters thing, okay. Um, and now we get to some not so fun news. Um, Dave DeCamp from Antiwar dot com published this, and they put it on Instagram. I thought this was an excellent way to summarize it in one screen. Mm. Gaza Health Ministry releases the names of 710 infants under a year old killed by Israeli forces. And this, this, unlike, yep. unlike the BBC, unlike CNN, antiwar.com, Indie Media Award Honoree will tell you who did it and like it is, and not sugarcoat it. Dave writes, Gaza's health ministry has released a 649 page document that lists the names of 34,344 Palestinians who have been killed by Israelis by Israel's assault on the Gaza Strip. The document lists 11,355 children, including 710 infants under the age of one, as Palestinian babies have been killed throughout the genocidal campaign. The infants are listed on the first 14 pages of the document. Of the 649 pages. So again, and that's last month after the three day after three day old twins were killed by Israeli forces. And I remember we talked about that, or maybe you guys did. The health ministry said the number of newborns killed since October 7th had reached 115. Newborn babies have also starved to death, and Israeli troops left four premature babies to die at the Al Nasser hospital last year than they with the incubators. Gaza's mm -hmm. media office says more than 16,700 children have been killed by Israeli forces in Gaza. The list released by the health ministry includes the names of only those who have been fully identified. The ministry is still working to identify the remaining over 7,000 bodies it has counted and said Monday that the death toll is currently at 41 to 26, but we've heard others like the Lancet and others put the count much, much higher, multiple times. Way like, higher. Like 10x almost, yeah. practically. They stopped really adding to the count six months ago almost, it feels like. And, yeah, it's heartbreaking, but, you know, we have to we have to talk about it and can't take our eye off of this. Um, speaking of Dave DeCamp, again, Indie Media Award honoree, that's... That's his Zago Brothers illustration. I brought another piece that he wrote for anti-war because he's full of good news this week. U.S. Navy chief unveils plan to be ready for war with China by 2027. 
Yep, it's coming, folks. And the military is getting ready. All right. And this one, I yep. actually, it's it's short because it's, it's a Dave DeCamp article. So thankfully, we can bring the whole article and it's short. Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Lisa Franchetti, the highest ranking officer in the U.S. Navy, unveiled a plan on Wednesday to be ready for a war with China by 2027 as the U.S. military is preparing for a direct fight with Beijing despite the risk of nuclear war. Yep. The plan lays out goals to be reached by 2027, including making 80% of the naval force ready for combat deployments on short notice. Even though we covered last two weeks ago with Kit Clarenberg that our aircraft carriers and Navy is effectively dead in the water, and sending an aircraft carrier yep. group would result in nothing but the deaths of American soldiers and all of our ships sunk. So yeah, let's keep doing that. Franchetti told the Associated Press, we know that, that they're the biggest propagandists on Earth, that she wants to increase combat readiness to so that if the nation calls us, we can push the go button and we can surge our forces to be able to meet the call because we don't have enough bases in Taiwan and the Philippines and uh, Australia and Japan and the Marianas yep. and, 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 and. Seoul, South Korea, may I continue? The plan lays out goals to be reached by 2020. So like I said, other goals include re increasing recruitment because they've used all our soldiers up and they're on multiple deployments, improving Navy infrastructure yeah. because our infrastructure is shit just like everywhere, removing delays in ship maintenance. Good luck with that because we have rotting, aging aircraft carriers and, use, and increasing the use of drones and other autonomous systems. Yes, they want to murder people cowardly and remotely. Franchetti said that the U.S. is taking lessons from Ukraine's operations against Russia in the Black Sea and the U.S.'s new war against the Houthis in Yemen. U.S. Navy ships have battled the Houthis since January in what U.S. commanders have called the largest U.S. naval battle since World War II, but the campaign has failed to deter or stop Houthi attacks. Yes, because missiles from land to sea attacks are not something that our ships can really handle. Franchetti said that she's focusing on getting ready for war with China by 2027 because that is the year of President Xi told his forces to be ready to invade Taiwan. However, that idea is, yeah, however, that idea is only based on claims from U.S. intelligence officials because we know they always tell the truth. And they definitely don't want to do anything to set up their, their defense contractor buddies, right? Nope. You would never no. do that. Nope. While China has ambitious goals for its military, there's no evidence of a direct order to be ready for an invasion of Taiwan by 2027. Earlier this year, Defense News reported that Xi raised the issue with President Biden when the two leaders met in San Francisco in November 2023, but... Of course, Mushbrain couldn't remember anything anyway. Recounting the meeting, a U.S. official said, Xi basically said, look, I hear all these reports in the United, in the United States of how we're planning for military action in 2027 or 2025. There are no yeah, such they're plans. they're claiming that's when China's going to invade Taiwan, right? Right. Well, that, that's what so, Xi know. is saying. He's already hearing that that's what the military is telling this. Because, of course, they've tapped into all of our phones and they're listening and they know exactly what the generals are saying. He says, no one yeah. has talked to me about this, G Bear. All right. Um, the Defense News report noted how the claims about a Chinese invasion of Taiwan have helped funnel money to a U.S. military buildup in the Asia Pacific. Nah. You mean the defense contractors are going to get rich? Off of a buildup because they're fear mongering about a potential war with China? No way, they would never do that. The claim about the, a 2027 invasion was first made in 2021 by a retired admiral, Bill Davidson, the former head of U.S. Indo Pacific Command, who, again, let me guess, he's, a, he's now working as a lobbyist or a board member for one of the defense contractors. That would be my guess. I don't know. Yeah. I have not looked Raytheon. that up. 
General Caliber. Dynamics, General Dynamics, or yeah. or or um, Northrop Grumman, one of them. Well, the concern it generated earned a nickname, the Davidson Window, shorthand for the near-term threat of an attack on Taiwan, because he made it up. Defense News reported that, of course, that that changed how Congress spent money. The Pacific Deterrence Initiative doesn't have its own budget, but in the last few years, the U.S. has spent more on its forces in the region, which, again, we know. This is the long game, is that they know that they're preparing for war with China. Now, Indy Media Awards, like I said, these are some of the um, plaques or the, you know, whatever. These are going to be at the headers or at the top of all of the Indy Media Award pages. I'm going to provide these to all the honorees themselves to use however they see fit. Uh, this is for Dave DeCamp. We've also got one for antiwar.com. These are, again, illustrations by Zago Brothers, including the logos, which is really cool. Uh, that we, we really appreciate that. So uh, if you really, you know, again, please support independent media and support independent art. There are some links and ways to do so. And the money for the last month or so has been going toward the Zago Brothers. There's actually a little bit more than 12% of our, of our goal there, uh, which is 240 bucks, because just this morning, somebody was really nice and I got a hundred dollar PayPal. So that will be going over to them and a couple other people have contributed as well, but uh, I still owe Zago a few hundred bucks towards the, all of the illustrations. He's been nice enough to kind of let us pay it down as we collect it. And, uh, and he's very supportive of independent media as well. And we're starting to see already that like Connor Freeman from anti-war and Kyle Anzalone, and again, honoree from the initial class was uh, they've used them now for their profile pics on on Twitter, which is really cool. Appreciate that. And, uh, and we appreciate that.